Hello everybody. I'm Martin Brackenbury. I'm the person who's going to interview this group of people, professionals, about over tourism. And I want this to be something of a uh, conversation. And in order to try and focus on the, the right things, I want first of all for you to put up your hands if you believe that over tourism is an issue. And I, before you put your hands up immediately, I just want to read out what Harold gave to me, what he thinks uh, that uh, over tourism is. He says, it is destinations where hosts or guests, locals or visitors, feel that there are too many visitors and that the quality of life in the area or the quality of the experience has deteriorated unacceptably. It's the opposite of responsible tourism, which is about using tourism to make better places to live in and better places to visit. Often, both visitors and guests experience the de deterioration concurrently. So I want to ask you now, because I'm going to move my discussion according to your response. Do you think that over-tourism is an issue? Hands up, please. Was that a majority, gents? I think so. I think so. Okay, what this does, it allows me to focus much more, not so much on whether there's a problem, which we all seem to recognize very largely here, but what are the potential solutions? And the first person that I want to talk to is uh, Juan Torreya from Barcelona. And he is the tourism director um, uh, at the Barcelona City Council. Of course, Barcelona is famous for other reasons recently. Uh, but we're not going to talk about those things. But Juan, what I want to ask you first of all is that Barcelona is an open, tolerant city. And I am sure you want to maintain that. But I don't think anybody would contradict me if I say that in Barcelona, you recognize the problem early and that you now have the support from politicians. You are leaders in tackling, tackling over tourism. So can you tell us what have been the most successful management interventions that you've, been, you've made, and what has worked practically, strategically, and what hasn't? So, Juan. Uh, it's a short question. Hmm? It's a short question for a start, <laughs> this yeah. discussion about that. <clears throat> How many time I have to that? <laughs> Well, you've got, let's say you have no, 10 minutes, you know, you can, yes, at most. Okay. <clears throat> I think that first of all, um, we need to, to understand that Barcelona as a destination, as a tourist destination, is relatively uh, short in the time. Only mm -hmm. 25 years ago, mm -hmm. after the Olympics, start the, the, the new or the, 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 the current era in terms of tourism. Um, I don't know if it, we... Uh, was really early when we identify over tourism in Barcelona, but uh, I, I am sure because I, I live that uh, in 2006, 15 years more or less after the starting mm -hmm. Turismo de Barcelona as a consortium for promote tourism, um, Barcelona presents the first um, problems relate, relative with, with tourism in terms of um, no senses for the, the neighbors, problems in some places around the iconic places in Barcelona. Was then when, when, when the, the, the government of the city decided to make a new strategic plan of tourism during 2008 and 2009. And um, just in the end of 2010, we approved this plan. And in my opinion, as a solution of this plan, the main that I want to underline is the, the governance aspects in tourism. Because until, uh, until then, Barcelona has only invested in promotion because we came from uh, mm. no tourism yeah. uh, in the city. And from then, we uh, invest in, in management in the city. 
In fact, as a consequence of this uh, strategic plan of tourism, the City Council created the Department of Tourism in the City Council. And another thing more important, um, at least, that is the, the, uh, a commission for coordinate and boost the, politicas, the, the, politici the politis, policies, I'm sorry, the policies in relate, related with tourism in the different areas in the City yes. Council. Mm. Um, this is the, probably the first, the first moment that we have, it's 2010. After this, uh, this year, during the 10, 15, uh, 2010, 2015, Barcelona suffered some um, problems related with over tourism. In fact, in, in the summer in 2014 was when uh, exploit in some, in some places, a big demonstration against tourism in La Barceloneta, famous in, 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 May, in media, uh, etc. And uh, after that, uh, in Barcelona, in Spain in general, we have uh, municipal elections uh, during in May 2015. In this period, the, the tourism uh, debate about tourism was really um, fundamental in Barcelona, at least, and um, underlined the, 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 the political debate in the city. And finally, the, the new government after 2015, the, the tourist policy is the, 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 probably the main issue uh, that is uh, put in place in, in, in the beginning. The first decision uh, in 2015, the new government, I think that was in July, when the side three important uh, issues around uh, the, the, the government of the um, ma management of tourism, that is to stop uh, licenses for accommodation, uh, tourist accommodation, is a controversial topic, but it's a, mm. an important decision. The second one was create the um, the Barcelona Tourist of, Tourist of Council and City Tourist Council of Tourism and City. Sorry, to Council of Tourism and City. That is a participatory body mm. with it represented all the uh, stakeholders, all the actors related with tourism in, in the city. Only. Uh, not only the, the, the private sector, not only the administration, also the neighbors, academy, academia, or political groups, etc. And the third one was the, the make a new strategic plan of tourism for Barcelona 2020. This plan is our, our, our roadmap in this moment, and uh, it's just here when uh, the topic of over tourism, without this name probably, but we speak about the major affluence spaces because we understand that the number, the, the figures that tourism in Barcelona are not um, huge in terms of the proportion that the, the city can um, uh, absorb. But yes, when it's concentrated in the same time and the same place, a lot of people around the places where it's for living and the places where the, the, the inhabitants uh, live together with the visitors. The problem in over tourism, in my opinion, is in these places. Obviously, uh, having the, the major affluence spaces as a protocol, as an idea, as a, a strategy for, for attack, for tackling uh, specifically um, the palliative solutions is important. But it's also important, and probably most important than the, before, the, the, the first thing, is to have uh, governance bodies that allows us to, to, to share with the different uh, stakeholders, opinions, and introduce in the debate a new point of view, not only from the famous and successful partner, uh, public-private par partnership. Mm -hmm. It's important because, in, in, us, in our opinion, the, in fact, we created finally the, the Council of Tourism and City in May 2016, mm -hmm. and is uh, already one year and a half ago. And it's a successful experience because uh, it's already working <laughs> in one year ago. And um, a lot of working groups are uh, involving different uh, sensitivities uh, in around this, this kind of, of questions. Can I, can I stop you there just a second? What, are the, what have you learned from this council so far? What are the kind of things you have learned from them by embracing all these different stakeholders in tourism? The main thing is that the, the, the good experience to, to, to put together these different sensitivities uh, talking about tourism. Mm -hmm. In Barcelona, the conflictivity, uh, the mm -hmm. conflict w between the, the, the industry and probably the, the causes of over-tourism or that some, somebody explains as uh, tourist phobia, that is a 
mm. terrible word in my opinion, mm. but it is a sensitivity who is in, bon in, in part is a consequence of the not di no dialogue between different actors in the city. When um, we have considered um, fantastically important, etc., the partnership between public and, um, and public, public and private, and sorry, mm -hmm. that uh, we uh, mm, that mm, sorry about the word, but no. it's only between the, the industry and the administration, but not neighbors, not academy, not etc. Yeah. Yeah. To consider this, this different point of view in the debate is essential yeah. because the solution for manage the public space who is the owner of the public space are the citizen yes. uh, we need the citizens opinion and we need mm -hmm. the, the citizen sensitivity mm -hmm. etc this is in in our opinion the first uh, learning thing that we have mm -hmm. uh, understood here okay they're very interesting and a very useful lesson for others i think um i would like to move on now to jonathan Keats, who's chair of Venice in peril. Now, uh, un unlike Juan, who is responsible directly with others in the city council, you are perhaps a grandstander. Um, now, you could argue that Venice is part of global heritage and that as such concerns us all. What do you see as the main peril in Venice? Is it the sea, the cruise lines, or the sheer volume of visitors? I think at the moment that there, uh, I would have been tempted to say the sea, uh, but at the moment the experiment with the uh, barriers in the lagoon is being uh, carried out. It, I say experiment because uh, they've only just begun to install the first, uh, uh, the first examples of these. Um, and therefore, uh, let's put that on one side for a moment. The cruise liners are still a threat uh, to the city in various ways. It's now been shown that the uh, the actual effluent from their, the actual exhaust from their engines, the emissions from their engines, is more is more dangerous to the buildings than the backwash of uh, the uh, the displacement that these enormous ships create. But at the moment, the real menace to the continuity of the city as a viable civic entity, urban entity, community, is the tourist saturation. Um, and like Juan, who Juan mentioned the whole issue of the f concentration of tourism in certain particular spots, sort of hot spots of the city. This is the real problem at the moment the extraordinary thing, the interesting thing to note about Venice is that um, uh, the, the tourists will all concentrate, so to speak, in what we might call the front end of the city, around, if you know your Venice, around Piazza San Marco um, the, uh, and slightly further up the Grand Canal around the Rialto. And in the rest of the city, it is a, uh, a, a walkable, um, viable communal space where the tourists will not gather except the more adventurous ones. Uh, but the problem at the moment is the, the in, intolerable concentration of human numbers in these small spaces which are still thoroughfares in what is still a living city. When I first came to Venice in the 90, late 1960s, the population was 120,000. It's now around 56,000, um, which is an appalling uh, collapse in the number of numbers of those living there. There are all sorts of reasons for that. Um, but uh, we are dedicated at Venice in Peril um, to 
uh, sustaining the built environment so that people can go on living in the city. But it's very, very difficult in these public spaces. Can I, can I stop you there? Because what I'd like to explore um, is really what do you think could be done to manage tourism in Venice better, given what you have described? Um, I think, first of all, uh, the, um, the tourist tax has to be increased. This is very unpopular with, obviously, uh, with hoteliers, with uh, uh, um, businesses of all kinds, with restaurateurs, but it has to be, this has to be done um, uh, in order to um, uh, actually deal with the problems created by uh, what we might call tourist accretion. Um, I think that uh, negotiations with um, uh, those bringing tourists into the city, it, we haven't quite got to the stage of time tickets, but it's almost, it is being talked about. Um, the, uh, the possibility has been floated. I think this would be very difficult to manage um, of not exactly of turnstiles, but of some kind of managing the numbers uh, within the piazza along the Riva degli Schiavoni, which is the, uh, the main uh, um, sort of waterside walkway along the, uh, the lagoon um, and around the Rialto. Um, but I, I think it's a major problem which um, the, the managing the tourist numbers, which I don't think they've arrived at a practical, uh, yet at the ideal practical solution, and it's very difficult to see what that might be at this stage. Okay, thanks very much. Now, I would like go to go to Tim, if I may. Tim Fairhurst. I don't know what's happening. But anyway, uh, Tim, uh, you're head of strategy and policy at DITOA. And um, I know as an association, you've been doing work with many destinations on the issue of overcrowding in destinations. How big an issue is it? Well, it's, it's very big here. There seems to be a capacity problem in this room, but people still came. Yes. So, you know, clearly not enough seats and we should all complain immediately. I think it's important because people are talking about it, just to state the obvious. So if it's topical, it needs addressing and there's a reason for it. Um, I'd like to pick up on a couple of things, Juan, say if, if yeah. I may. Um, uh, when we've had conversations before, he's talked about managing a tourism city yeah. as opposed to managing tourism in a city. Uh, and I think it was that you know, holistic approach and that framing of the situation which is the advance you need to make. So tourism's not just a little add-on that you can add or take away. Mm -hmm. It is something that's very integrated into the supply chain, into the economy, uh, absolutely into the residential community to a greater or lesser extent. Mm -hmm. And I think the essential piece is the balance between the visitors, residents and industry. Mm -hmm. That's a platitude. Uh, and, and everyone says that's a very easy thing to say. We did some work with Florence last year uh, where we surveyed residents in collaboration with the city and the local newspaper, La Nazione and the Centro Studi Turistici, um, and we had three, 4,000 respondents. And the, the summary response was that residents were comfortable with the idea that tourism would grow if there was a plan. And I think a lot of the concern arises from the fact there's no plan. So I think when cities such as Barcelona or Bruges or Amsterdam or wherever it might be articulate a plan that has evidently arisen through consultation with residents, with business, and there will be arguments. You know, there are all sorts of conflicting goals. If you know, someone with local regulatory power in Venice approved a cruise terminal, Right? So, so your local politicians are generally the people who have the levers of control and it is very much up to the uh, sort of local community to work with politicians to express this is the kind of city we want to live in. What business does is operate within the rules 
that are provided. So I think, you know, I know that's a slightly lazy cop out, uh, but on the whole, you know, businesses certainly do not want to put their customers in a place where they're being treated as an unwelcome pest. Um, and I think some of the language we've seen uh, that's hostile to tourism verges on hate speech. Uh, and I think particularly Europe, and, and it's always very much focused on Europe as a destination, not globally, uh, there's a real risk of complacency in Europe that, you know, we're, we're lovely, we're old, we're cultural, people will keep visiting. Well, actually, no, they won't if they're treated with contempt and hostility. So I think we need to think about what a welcome is, but exactly how to optimize the carrying capacity of a city is a discussion. Uh, there are many things about European cities which could easily uh, relax in terms of people flow if the opening hours were different, if days of the week opening were different, uh, if there was more facilities for parking. Uh, there are lots of ways in which we use our cities inefficiently, where with a much more holistic and long-term approach, putting vehicles somewhere else, maximizing okay. pedestrians, we could do better. So what you're arguing is really what Juan has done so far is precisely what cities really should do, yeah. embracing all the stakeholders yeah. uh, in, in intelligent ways to actually, as he used the word sensitivities of the different stakeholders and, and looking at opportunities for making improvements. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Let me move on, if I may, to, I, I want to come to you now, Gary. We meet uh, here every year, don't we? Um, now look, TUI is a, a gigantic operation. It's uh, obviously, uh, you know, it's a public company. It's concerned with growth and so on. Um, and yet you've also had a strong commitment to making your own operations more sustainable. Uh, and you appear to be making progress. But how do you see the problems of over-tourism and host and guest dissatisfaction that's one part of the, this question. And the other is, what influence does TUI have at the destination level to really make a difference along the lines of the things we've been discussing so far? Oh, I, think that, I think both of the questions are, are, are connected. I mean, at TUI, as you say, we mm. invest in the whole value mm. chain from mm. aircraft to hotels uh, and within the destinations. And, and given the cost of those component parts, mm -hmm. if we're going to be making an investment of oh. two or three hundred million euro in a hotel or yeah. two hundred million euro in an aircraft, yeah. we need to make sure that there is long term economic sustainability of where we are building that hotel or where we're sending that aircraft. And I think that, that you know, it's very, very important to us when we invest in a destination that we engage from the beginning with the local authorities and the national authorities um, where applicable to talk about the types of benefits that tourism can bring. And I know the UN has talked very, very um, favorably about the, mm. the social and the economic mm. um, benefits that, that tourism can bring. And it's very important to us that when we're investing that we see those benefits being shared. Because quite clearly, as, as, as we've all said, if you operate in a destination where your guest is not welcomed, mm. the guest will choose not to go there again. Mm. Um, and therefore, it's very important when we're making investments that we see them being for 10, 20, 30 years. Now, it's very interesting that the over-tourism piece um, seems to have come to fruition more and more in recent years. And I think when you look at the disintermediation of the sector, when you look at entrance of new players in the sector, I think we have to question who are the stakeholders within these destinations? Who has the interests of the communities within these destinations? And therefore, the investments that they're making, they're ensuring they go back there. And I would say that from, from a TUI perspective, you know, A, we make long-term sustainable investments. B, we are very, very keen that, that when we're making large investments, the communities involved. About three years ago, we worked with PwC um, on a program in Cyprus called Total Impact Measurement and Management. And that was looking at, within our hotels, um, the economic impact, the, the tax impact, the social impact, mm. and the environmental impact. Mm. And both the, 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 the um, economic um, and tax mm. impact was 84 euro per person per night. The social impact was about 20 cents per person per night. 
But clearly, what we have to do is where you are making that positive contribution, you're reinvesting. So you're ensuring that within the, the value chain, whether it's food that you're buying for the hotels, mm -hmm. that that is being locally sourced, whether the people being employed in the hotels, that they are from the local community, mm -hmm. that when customers are offered excursions, those excursions are to local sites where mm -hmm. the direct... Um, uh, you know, the direct impact of those is going to the local community yeah. as well, because then you're creating a very sustainable environment. Mm. And I think that it's up to all of us, I mean, TUI obviously being, being one of the leaders, but it's up to all of the tourism organizations to put pressure on tourism boards to care. Because Sorry, often, on what? On tourism boards and tourism organizations yes. of yes. the destinations yes. to care about these things. Yes. Because often we find when we speak to tourist boards, they're measured on the number of passengers arriving at the airport. And this is the wrong measure mm. if you are going to work for the long-term sustainable benefit yeah. of the destination. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, it's now, I think, the time to come and look at the UNWTO. Uh, Carlos Vogela is from the UNWTO and is a director of member relations. Um, um, the minister's summit tomorrow is on over tourism. Growth is not the enemy, it's how we manage it. But it's clear recognition there is a problem in some way. Why did UNWTO choose to focus on over-tourism at this, this minister's summit for tomorrow morning? Thank you for the question, Martin, because it's a very easy one. As the audience just gave you the answer when you asked yeah. the initial mm. question if they thought yeah. this was an issue. I know, but this is a special audience. <laughs> well, no, and yours is a global audience. I think it proves the case that yeah. uh, there is a concern. Mm. It proves the case that it's, uh, it's becoming an issue and therefore UNWTO as the specialized agency of the United Nations for tourism cannot ignore it. And this is why we have to bring our ministers together and put it on the table and, and try to discuss. Now, we also think, I mean, all these excellent interventions that uh, took place have analyzed quite well the, the situation. And we talk about over tourism in a very generic way. I think it's probably the over of certain aspects of tourism. I don't think anybody is complaining, and definitely Barcelona is not complaining, about having too many congresses or having too many conventions. Mm. The problem lies in the fact that sometimes a part of the tourism that is arriving to the destination is not providing the benefits that the community is expecting. Mm. And that is where the clash comes. Mm. As long as the community sees certain benefits coming from the visitors, there will be a much better understanding between both, because I think it has been said that is probably the key of the problem. As we, are key, as, as we keep on saying, tourism growth is not the enemy, and we should not consider it as the enemy. It's the way in which we handle that growth Mm. the way in which we manage that growth. Um, I think we're all used about talking about load factors in natural environments. Mm. So we go to our natural parks and we say, this natural park has a certain load factor. We cannot go beyond mm. this number of visitors. Well, I don't know, I don't have the answer, but perhaps it has come the time where we also have to look at urban load factors, mm. considering also the fact that today 51% of our population, worldwide population, is concentrated in cities. And probably 10 to 15 years from now, that is going to go up to 70%. Mm -hmm. So it is time to address how we manage over tourism in cities, because that is where the problem right now is being identified. But it's not only cities, surely. I mean, if you, uh, if you think of some of these sort of hiking trails that are supposed to be wild, now you find that actually there are so many people, it's no longer wild. So do, do you think that these kind of ex areas which are outside, after all, we've been used to um, managing museums by time tickets and controlling the numbers that enter into a particular area. Now we've got these, I mean, I know you don't like the description, but they're in a sense 
open-air museums or open-air areas which people want to go to. It's not just cities. These are also, in a sense, overwhelmed with numbers. So it's a question of do we start managing those numbers? It is, after all, normally a public good you're talking about. And then if you introduce some way of controlling numbers going through, either with prices or timings or so on, you are actually then uh, entering into a quite different area and it make, it's quite difficult to think of how that can be managed. Well, we are much more used to manage a capacity in natural areas. Mm. Yes, there are some exceptions and there are yeah. some hiking trails that are yeah. overcrowded, yeah. but we are, we are much more, our mentality is much more geared in managing natural areas overflow, but not so much in managing it's, it's, urban it's, areas. Yeah, okay. Although I remember many, many years ago, I remember my tour operator times, where uh, Florence was starting to experience an overcrowded flow mm. of uh, tourism buses. Mm. And they decided somehow to introduce a certain mm. regulation on the access of tourism buses in the center of Florence. So I think that there are ways in which we need to manage this situation. It has come to a point where we cannot afford any longer to have tourism viewed mainly by the local communities, not as a benefactor, but as something which is disrupting their lives. Mm. And we need to look into quite the opposite. We need to look into how we make tourism a benefactor. I can understand perfectly well the case of Barcelona or the case of Venice, when all of a sudden you have thousands of people coming at the same time, going to the same places, and spending very little amount of money. And mm. I'm referring to yeah. those one-day visitors or cruise mm. visitors. So we need to find ways in which those people might go to different places. And for instance, product development is a very important aspect. We are now at a time where innovation and creativity are required for product development. Mm. We need to give the tourist a different product. We cannot keep on doing the same thing we have always done. So those are the type of things we should explore. Mm. Yes. Um, I th it just seems to me that what, you, what you've described, you say to find ways, there are beginning to be ways, like Juan has been working on. Um, there have been some small suggestions from Tim's side, which is more, the demand side is more difficult to manage, actually. Um, the supply side is the one in the end which is going to be the one which takes the biggest responsibility for this, it seems to me. You know, this is be partly urban planning, it will partly be management of visitors. Uh, is that right or is that wrong? Come in, Tim. Yeah. Is he live? Yeah, Tim? Yeah. No? No, Tim, yeah. I could say, here we go. Yeah. So uh, you're asking whether it's, it's more demand or supply led. Um, I think on product development, it's got to be both. Um, I think, let's, go, let's take Florence as an example. If you look <coughs> at visitor volume to the famous museums, by far and away, the bulk of the uh, visits go to the Uffizi and the Academia. Um, and you probably saw those discussion this summer about whether or not to take David out of the academia, exactly where he'd go, I don't know. Um, he obviously started out outside, but he prefers to be inside now. But, but the point clearly is that the famous names sell. So that's a truth about marketing, and certainly for people who are visiting Europe for the first time, it's very hard to say, don't bother with that. It's not that interesting. You can possibly say, have a look at it, it will take you three hours to line up to get inside it, so are you sure? So I think there are ways, particularly with group tourism, where you've got a, a group organizer who has an audience who trusts and listens to their counsel, and you can say, well, how about trying these other museums because they have lots of art by the same famous people, it's just different. And actually, the Bargello is an interesting building, here's why. So I think we can at least try uh, to coax people to, let's say, the somewhat less famous um, and see how far we you get. you sure it's not a red herring, Rat, really? No, I don't think it's a red herring. I think it happens already. 
Um, I mean, there's plenty of people in the cultural tourism sector who absolutely do do that because they are trying to make the most out of a finite amount of time. Mm -hmm. There is capacity limit. You can't now guarantee that you can get your customers into a very famous, popular place next summer. So you might actually say, I want to book tickets somewhere where I know I can get them in rather than take my chances at the very famous place. So I think that's happening now in order that operators don't lose credibility on the day. So I think there is a demand side uh, uh, in terms of making the most of the time. I think some smart city technology is going to come in helping visitors once they're there navigate more intelligently so they will be guided by uh, digital assistance to places which are less busy. They already do that in, in Barcelona. Yeah. Right. So I'm sure more of that will come. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was wondering, do you think that, because we talked about disintermediation, um, the avalanche of increases into particularly cities like uh, Venice or Barcelona, but others included, um, have come about uh, in many ways as a result of low-cost airlines, Airbnb platforms and uh, Booking.com and things of that kind, which have allowed people to simply uh, use their, their uh, mobile uh, and uh, make their bookings and off they go. Um, and it's, it's transformed the, sh the sheer numbers that we're experiencing. And actually, when TUI used to be with Thompson and so on, uh, uh, managing the very large proportion of people going there, they were able to manage it much better. Now, of course, it's all individual. And you, you, you're suffering in, in Barcelona through that disintermediation, aren't you? And, I, and uh, is that one of the reasons why you've decided as a city council, uh, as a city council to focus on a tourism city because you know you can't talk to partners in the same way as you used to be able to talk to them because they come as individuals. Uh, <clears throat> this kind of disintermediation in my opinion is clearly a new paradigm of uh, yeah. tourism in, in this yeah. moment and any uh, can be the same than before yeah. after that this kind of platforms that facilitate extraordinarily uh, the supply and the demand. Mm. Um, and also, that means a change in the, in the way to, to travel, to way, the way to visit. And, the, and uh, in, this, in this place, um, the, uh, our experience in Barcelona, uh, not only, but especially related with the accommodation sector, is the need to, uh, to, 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 to ask responsibility to these platforms. Mm. This, charac this character of global platforms make difficult mm. to put face mm -hmm. to these pl platforms and to dialogue, dialogue directly with them. Yeah. And it's really important, these global platforms, to concrete in the local level for um, dialogue with them and to establish uh, the common rules to manage this, this issue. Are you people. managing to do that yet? Yeah, we are trying to do it. Uh, in fact, in fact, uh, with the platforms in this moment in Barcelona, from I think that in, in last May, we have created a, a working group with four the main four platforms. Mm -hmm. um, I'm working in, in a in a common um, in a common document with the common responsibilities and trying to identify that the, the, the success of this, their activity is the success of the city and in the opposite way, because we need together the city as a place for visit well and to live well. Mm. Uh, this working group is, is already uh, running now and uh, we are trying to, to attract also Airbnb, who is mm. the, the main uh, provider of, mm. of accommodation uh, in Barcelona and the world in general. And I think that we are in the, in the, in the correct way to do it. Mm. Um, we are mm. uh, optimistic in this, in this ah, good. Good place. Yes. Good. Yes. What were you going to say? Yes. May I say something on that? Uh, okay. uh, okay. uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, the Airbnb issue in Venice, because this has been a bone of contention recently between the residents um, and the, uh, the um, 
various tourist bodies and, and, uh, uh, and the city council. Um, the residents uh, say it's undercutting the hotels, um, that it is, um, uh, th that it's, um, uh, it's a negative good for the city. Um, but the counter argument is that in a city where there is so much property that is only used um, for a few, so much empty property that is used for very brief periods in the year by people living in Milan, in Rome, uh, outside Italy, who might have uh, just apartments in Venice for um, uh, visiting uh, for holidays, etc., etc., that this that Airbnb is in fact attracting people to experience the dimension of living in Venice and taking um, and as it were simulating the experience of the resident mm. um, because it cuts out the intermediary of the hotel. Um, they're doing their own shopping, they're coming and going as and when, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and it is actually giving the city, uh, if you like, an artificial extra, uh, however brief, temporary population. Um, and this is an argument in favor of Airbnb. But it is a huge bone of contention at the moment in Venice, and there's very much um, a sort of right thinking approach and uh, uh, a wrong attitude and people can be extremely censorious. Yes, yeah, but the, I, I remember uh, some years ago I, I was involved with the University of Venice and um, the, 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 the kind of studies that they were doing demonstrated that the residents who were upset were the ones that were not engaged in any way in uh, the benefits from tourism. Yes. The ones that were engaged, although they were residents, were actually, they say, well, okay, it's one of the consequences. Whereas yes. the ones who are not engaged are the ones who are vociferously against yes. the kind of developments. That and is. and uh, I think when we talk about residents, we ought to be very careful in the measures we use as those ones who are engaged in tourism in one way or another and those who are not. Yes. I think that's most helpful if we do that. Yeah. Do you want to say something? Yeah. Can make, if I can make a point on that, I think that, again, from Tui's perspective, you know, we are well, neither in favour yeah. of um, the, the sharing oh, economy or against the sharing economy yeah. because they operate in a, in a different sector. Yeah. But if I, <laughs> if I can speak on behalf of the hoteliers yes. who we work with and, and, and being hoteliers ourselves, our hotel partners have to go through rigorous Mm. checks for health mm. and safety, mm. for quality, yeah. um, for licensing, mm. for employment, yeah. and are very comprehensively taxed um, mm. for that, and rightly so. Mm. Mm. And I think if there are other entrants into the market, then they need to go through similar rigorous mm. tests because mm. you have to create a, a level playing field. Yeah. And I think that if you are fortunate enough to, to own a residence in both Florence and Venice, then I think it should be no problem for you to, to, to pay back some of the money that you are taking from the touristic economy yeah. in, in the form of taxation. Yeah. And I don't know if that is comprehensively practiced within the sharing economy. And I think we would very, very um, vehemently encourage that a level playing field is created in order to do that. I think, I mean, I'm not going to go to you, Juan, but Juan, it's right, is it not, that you've already begun the process of trying to ensure that those offering Airbnb kind of uh, activities are only taking place in um, tourism-based, uh, tourism-licensed areas? <coughs> Or is it dis distinguished between the two? I can't remember exactly how you do it. No. Briefly, yeah. Well, the, the, main, the main thing that is to, to understand that the, the accommodation, tourism accommodation, are not neutral for the population. Yeah. Because in, it is very, real dif really different the impact of, uh, for example, an hotel or a hotel uh, or the uh, tourism apartment inside a housing place. Mm. Uh, when the proportion of number of Mm, flats dedicated to uh, vacational activities is 
higher than the housing, the housing flats, the, the chains uh, occasioned in the, in the city are really huge. Mm. The commercial yeah. Yeah. Tra tra mm, fabric of the city, the, the use of the, spa the public space, the, the face of the city change, even the attraction, the, tra yeah. the attractive of the, of the city. Yeah. In this way is when the city, the, the, the city council, the administration needs tool tools for limit this kind of activity because the market alone is uh, uh, mm, mm, filling absolutely the, the housing uh, supply mm. yeah. uh, in vacational yeah. users and uh, we need to, to, to limit this, this activity. After that, the second, the second thing is to how to control this limit and to how, how to avoid mm. yeah. this uh, legality, you know, the yeah. illegality. And the end, if, even when an army of inspectors, you cannot uh, uh, avoid this activity, you need to uh, agree with the main platforms is the, the, that they said before in the third level. Mm. You need to agree with them uh, common ways, common rules, common uh, 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 agreement for yeah. uh, manage all together. Fascinating, actually. So actually you can argue uh, then that, um, Gary, you're they are beginning, at least in the Barcelona example, and we need the same sort of things to happen elsewhere. Mm. Now you, I know, have been waiting a long time to speak. So, Carlos. I forgot what I had to say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you were talking about this intermediation, Martin, and you were alluding to the fact that this might be a consequence of this intermediation. I don't really think so. I think we have a different way of mediation. Yes, low-cost airlines, mm true disintermediation is happening. But when you're talking about digital platforms, where are they? They are mediators. Yeah. In, the, in the digital platforms, you have two kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. You have the end supplier who is providing the accommodation, be a private accommodation mm -hmm. or whatever, and you have a distributor or mediator, which is yeah. a digital platform. Mm -hmm. Calling it sharing economy, I think is misleading because it brings a social component that from the economic view, it doesn't have. Mm. It might have a social component from the experience point of view, but definitely that is not economy, mm. that is social. So the first thing I think we need to understand is that this is a business. It's a business produced by two agents. One is the end supplier and the other one is the digital platform. Mm. And it has to be included in the value chain of businesses, mm -hmm. meaning we need to ensure that those services are provided with the proper mm -hmm. legislation, with the proper safety regulations. And moreover, you were talking about those residents that see the benefit are obviously in favor of tourism or even probably over tourism. And those that don't see it, they are not. I can imagine if I buy a flat in a nice, beautiful district of Barcelona, and I pay a high price for it. <clears throat> and I know my neighbors every day, and I say hello to them, and all of a sudden, I have a different neighbor every single day in the apartment next door. How would I feel with my investment? So those are the type of things that need to be addressed. Is that the consequence of the problems we are facing in over-tourism? No. Probably not. It's just one more thing that has contributed to tourism growth. But tourism growth is healthy. It's something we want. We also need to work on the traveler himself or herself. We need to work on providing tips to travelers to behave properly when they visit the destinations. And I think that is another challenge we'll have to face. Mm. I should say that Venice has recently introduced precisely that last aspect that you were talking about, um, the, uh, um, the initiative called Enjoy Respect Venice, which uh, um, controls or fines or disciplines travelers um, speaking, uh, travelers uh, uh, um, stripping off and jumping into the canals, eating on the steps of churches, uh, and generally treating the place as a kind of extended marble beach, if you like, rather than a viable city. They've all spoken. What questions have you got? We've got time for a few questions. One question here, yes. Now, so we need a, a mic. Say who you are and then give us a question. Yeah? Uh, thank you. Stella. 
Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Louise from Visit Flanders. Um, we have this year started with a project that includes a, a survey within all the different art cities and we have been looking at um, what it's like for residents and we've had some very interesting things that tie into some of the things that has, have been said about the benefits and the um, knowledge or knowing um, what the benefits are of tourism and the way that you view it, it's positive and negative. So mm. that's one step. Um, but one thing I was wondering is because um, we mentioned a couple of times that it's how we manage it and that a holistic and long-term approach is necessary where you include all the stakeholders. Um, but maybe a bit of a question to challenge that is um, is that really right? Is that enough? Is it enough to um, go for a holistic approach? Are we concerned enough? Because even without marketing uh, from NTOs and from cities, mm -hmm. the number of international arrivals will grow because more people are traveling and the people that do travel, travel more. Um, so that's basically my question. Are we concerned enough and is managing it, is that enough? especially looking at the long-term livability of cities uh, and of natural landscapes. Well, the question therefore is managing all this huge numbers enough, uh, or will we still find ourselves with considerable problems of over-tourism and talking about this at uh, World Travel Market every year and it gets worse. So is just managing it enough? Does somebody like to speak to that? Yes. I think we cannot prevent growth from happening. I think we need to continue to make tourism a right of people. Consequently, stopping that, reducing that. Moreover, I think we need to continue to become competitive in order to continue to grow. Our projections of growth to the year 2030 are around 3.3% per annum. This is going to take us from the existing 1.2 billion to 1.8. In addition to that, we will have to multiply that figure by five to obtain domestic tourism, because that one is only international. And over tourism is actually made up of both, international and domestic tourism. I don't think the secret is in trying to reduce that growth because that growth brings with it opportunities, it brings employment, it brings benefits, if well managed again, to the local communities. I think definitively, well, good management, sound management, sustainable management on the three dimensions, social, economic, and environmental, is the answer, not to stop people traveling. Juan. Yes, I, I think that the, the, the over-tourism is a global issue with the local concretions mm -hmm. and they are not received for general solutions. Mm -hmm. We need to concrete in, in each place and its situation. But mm -hmm. I think that one global thing really exists, that is the, the, the we need globally, we need all together to consider promotion, the marketing, as a tool of management. Normally we talk yeah. about um, management when the problem is already here, which is already over us. Mm -hmm. And we need to talk uh, how to make a new or a different promotion, uh, um, thinking about the consequence of this promotion for the local place. Uh, place. Um, to align the promotion as a management tool is a critical thing, in my opinion, because needs oriented to, pre to prevent the consequence that the marketing uh, um, make. I don't know. It, I can see that that's easy to say and must make sense, Juan, but how to actually construct that in a way which is attractive to tourists uh, and at the same time uh, makes, makes them come at certain times of the year or behave in certain ways. I mean, it, there are quite considerable issues relating to uh, changing the approach on marketing like that. Pro pro probably is a, is a romantic thought, but, <laughs> but um, we, we need to change the orientation of marketing as a attracting people tool for yeah. educating people tool. Mm -hmm. no? 
Um, the marketing is a, a way for explaining yes. the, the features of its place and the conditions to for, um, that we we ask them for to visit yes. is a is a is a different way for the marketing. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to do it. In fact, in Barcelona, we are starting in this moment a pro an interesting process to building a new pl pl marketing plan of Barcelona destination, thinking um, beyond the, the 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 promotion like mm -hmm. uh, until now we have understood understood no, and in, we trying to make the pro sustainable promotion for make a, a sustainable management in the city. Very interesting. We'd like to hear from you again another year. Now, how, do, how are we doing? 16.25. Have we got time for one more question? One more question. Okay. Yes. Uh, Say who you are. Uh, Rebecca from the city of Bath. Um, mm. We have a resident population of 1 to 21 visitors. So we are just experiencing um, some signs of over-tourism. I had a question for Juan because I read an um, article that said that you were trying to target different markets that behave more sustainably um, so uh, targeting northern US markets because they are more likely to be repeat visitors and they're more likely to explore other parts of the city um, I was just wondering how that's going for you I'm not sure to understood the question the, qu the question is about market segmentation are you trying to attract a different group of people from the people who've come to you in the past and have caused you problems. I mean, I, I have to say no, Bath is an no. interesting example because Ken Loach, who is a, um, he lives there, he's a famous uh, film director, he said that uh, tourism is ruining Bath, is his, it was his expression. And clearly you must be concerned when somebody like him says something like that. So it's a question of whether you've been successful in any way in uh, trying to encourage one group of people to come rather than one segment rather than another. Maybe you haven't got that far yet. No, I am not sure that to have answered that or for that because as I said now, uh, we are trying to build a new uh, marketing plan for Barcelona destination according to the, the conditions of our strategic plan of tourism. Yeah. And until now, it's true that the promotion from Barcelona happens in segments and different um, kind of people on different markets according to the capacities or possibilities or attractions of the city, uh, gastronomy, uh, culture, yeah. sports, um, business, etc. But uh, I think that probably this, this kind of segmentation is not necessarily good. We need to orient our promotion probably in terms of proximity, in terms of how many time we will spend visiting our city, how many uh, different issues that yeah. can to make more sustainable the, the situation in the Barcelona independently of the interest of each one of these groups. Yeah. It's obvious that mm, the people visit um, one destination for different reasons. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that the destinations must be must put some conditions also in these kind yeah. of visits, not only yeah. their at, uh, own attractives. Okay. Uh, I think we finished I think it's been a wonderful session. Thank you very much, everybody, for taking part. Thank you. Can, can I just take the opportunity to thank Martin and the rest of the panel for what's been a really good session, I think. What I would like to say is that next year there'll be far more on over-tourism. This issue is cropping up everywhere now, so it'll be a major theme of next year's show. So please come along. And if you've got ideas for things we should cover, please get in touch and let us know.